Eagles Entertainment. With the 10th pick in the 2021 NFL Draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select... You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast. Welcome to the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by Life Brand. I'm your host, Fran Duffy. We've got a special Q&A edition here of the podcast where today in Draft Buzz, we're going to catch up with Ben Fennel and Dane Brugler where we're just going to kind of hit the pause button a little bit. We're in a, a unique time period of the pre-draft cycle where the underclassmen deadline has passed. We covered all of the top underclassmen in last week's early week episode. We've got the Shrine Bowl that starts later this week. We've got the Senior Bowl next week. We've got the Combine just over a month away. And so I thought, you know what, with all the teams now, the fan base is really trying to get into the pre-draft process. Let's just kind of hit pause, reset, take a breath, and just answer as many of your questions as we could. And so we get to that here in Draft Buzz. Ben Fennell, Dane Brugler, answering as many of your questions as possible here in today's episode. We'll be back later this week to get you ready for the Shrine Bowl, get you ready for the Senior Bowl. We've got a lot in store later this week right here on the Journey of the Draft podcast. As always, the best way to reach us is to head on over to our Apple podcast page, leave us a rating, leave us a comment. If you ever have a question, you don't have to wait for a Q&A episode like this one. You can go on over to our Apple podcast page leave us a question there in the comment box it could be a mock draft for us to break down rankings you want us to kind of pick through whatever it is and we will answer it here on an upcoming episode that said let's get into this week's draft buzz excited to catch up with ben and dane for a little q a now it's time for draft buzz all right, well, I'm, as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, a special edition of Draft Buzz here is we're going to go full Q&A, full, full question and answer here uh, as I welcome in my buddies, Dane Brugler, Ben Fennell. Guys, uh, as I mentioned at the top, it's kind of we're in that unique kind of gray area of the, the, the draft cycle calendar where the underclassmen are, are now all officially declared. Senior Bowl, Shrine Bowl, they both kick up here in the next seven to ten days. So it's the, we're kind of on that precipice of where everybody's all in now uh, on draft season. Well, we have 28 NFL teams joining us. I think that's yeah. really the the collective start to draft season is when you have more and more fan bases and front offices turning that page. And unfortunately, four teams with some heartbreaking losses this past mm-hmm. weekend are now starting to stack their big boards and look into these all-star games. Yeah, no doubt. So let's get into uh, some of these questions. We're going to start first one off. Comes uh, from Patrick. What's the best position in this draft class? So I kind of sorted these guys to start like most general to kind of uh, dip our feet in and then more player specific as we go along. So, Ben, uh, help Patrick out here. What is the best position in this draft class? Well, I think the low hanging fruit is going to be the edge rushers. Yeah. For a number of reasons, because I think it's deep and elite at the top. I think there's some real quality high level starters in that kind of. 20 to 50 range and some really interesting developmental back end players that I think are going to slide to day three in combination, Fran, with some guys that I don't even know if I could call edge rushers at the next level with, you know, the DeMarvin Leals and Haskell Garrett's and Zachary Carter's and guys that played that heavy edge that are probably going to be three techs at the next level. But as far as true edge, the Thibodeaux, the Hutchinson's, the Carl Aftis, but don't forget about guys like Jermaine Johnson and Nick Benito and Kingsley Anabare. Cameron and how about Drake Thomas. Jackson and Cam Thomas and Arnold Ebicady? I'm super excited for this edge class. Very deep, heavy at the top, a lot of back end players. I think these guys are really going to contribute next year on Sundays. Yeah, Dane, I know a lot of people are very excited about this edge group. I know you're high on David Ojabo as well from Michigan, uh, who I believe went in the top 10 of your mock draft last week. Uh, what's another position group uh, that you're really high on here in this class? I really like the linebackers. Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's a position we're going to see well represented, I think, in every single round. In the first round, you've got your Devin Lloyds and the Kobe Deans. Both should be top 20, top 25 picks. Uh, day two with Quay Walker and uh, Channing Tindall from Georgia and uh, Chad Muma from Wyoming and uh, Leo Chanel from Wisconsin, Christian Harris, Alabama. And then on day three, I think there's uh, a lot of really good players that, you know, maybe some – could have gone top 100, but because there's so many linebackers, might get pushed down a little bit. Uh, like a Troy Anderson from Mon- Montana State, yep. uh, you know, who we've talked about before, 6'4", 235, going to run maybe in the four fives. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think it doesn't stop there. You talk about a Mike Rose from Iowa State, really versatile with what he offers. So linebacker, to me, is, is a position that's going to be, uh, you know, well-represented at every point in the draft. And there's going to be some future starters, maybe pro bowlers, coming from this group. 
Yeah. I mean, and when you're talking about what are the, the best positions in a draft, it's kind of what Ben, what you said at the top is like, okay, well you you have those blue chip players. Then you're looking at depth throughout and, and the Dan, I thought you crystallized it well saying, okay, they're going to be well represented at every stage of the draft. I think of this offensive tackle group and you will go to the blue chippers at the top with, you know, Evan Neal and Ikea Kwanu, Charles Cross of Mississippi state. You get to the latter stages of round one, early part of round two with the, the, the pennings and the Daniel Falaleles and Bernard Raymond's of the world, right? You start getting a design. Zion Johnson, obviously he's going to play more guard, but he's got that ability to be that body type. Max Mitchell from Louisiana. There's just a lot of really interesting players. Uh, the further you go down the board, you realize, man, like I'm, I'm 10, 11, 12 deep. Uh, you get to the early stages of day three, there are some really interesting players. So I think when you look at the offensive tackle class, uh, I would throw a corner in there as well. But offensive tackle uh, is, a, I think, is a, a pretty impressive strong point uh, here of this class. Let's get to another position group here with a question from Sugar Ricky, who left a uh, or le- left this question here about the wide receiver position. So, Dane, I'm going to come to you first for your top tier of wide receivers, but here's Ricky with the question. Who are the best two to three receiver prospects in the draft, and then where would they fit in immediately in the NFL? So I'm going to kind of parse this one out. Dane, I want to come to you for your top two, you know, that top two or three combo of wide receivers. And then, Ben, I'm going to come to you with what kind of offenses, what, what kind of situations do you think they best fit in, and we can kind of spin it from there. So, Dane, I'll come to you first. Yeah, well, it's hard to do two to three. I think I have to do six. I think there's yeah. six in that top tier. Uh, when you talk about Garrett Wilson from Ohio State, his teammate, Chris Olave, uh, Jamison Williams from Alabama, Traylon Burks, Arkansas, uh, Drake London, USC, and Jahan Dotson from Penn State. It's a really diverse group of receivers with what they offer. Some have size, some are more speed-based, some a little more polished than others. Um, and then you've got like a guy like Jamison Williams who's coming off the injury, but, I mean, did you, know, you guys saw Tyree Kill uh, on Sunday and what he did, the, just destroying angles with that speed. Jamison Williams, that, that that's something that he brings. Uh, not quite that speed, but close to it. So I, I, even though he's coming off the ACL injury, he still absolutely, it belongs in that top tier, could still go top 15, and I w- would not be shocked at all. So uh, I think when you talk about the top tier of receivers in this draft, you have to include all six of those guys. So the, the question was for two or three and Ben's expecting you to say two or three. And as soon as you say six, Ben just like starts scrambling uh, with his notes, which was a, a fun visual that only I will get to enjoy. Uh, ben, given those names, how do you kind of fit to see those guys fitting here uh, in the NFL? Well, you know, let me take a different approach to this because they're all talented receivers. Yeah, they're all they all have the ability to produce and be exceptional players on Sundays. And I think the receiver position has become one of the more translatable and early impact positions in the NFL with how these schemes have translated from Saturdays to Sundays, the more creative uses for players on Sundays and the willingness to hide certain traits to accentuate other traits. I mean, look at a guy like Cooper cup that, you know, has historically struggled against press coverage. He's in a lot of bunches and he's in a lot of stacks. He's in the slot a lot. He's on the move a lot trying to prevent him from getting jammed. So, you know, I look at the past couple of years and just the immediate impact rookies across the NFL, whether it was three years ago with DK and AJ Brown and Terry McLaurin. I mean, last year, the thousand yard receivers and Justin Jefferson and CD lamb. How about this year? Our own Devonte Smith, you know, Jamar Chase is 1600 yards, Jalen Waddle, all different sizes, shapes, abilities. But the thing I want to look at guys why don't don't young receivers produce when they're drafted mm. high? And the two major things I see, injuries, not taking care of your body, soft tissue injuries, things like that, and hands. Mm. You have to be able to catch the football in tight windows, contested windows, on the run. Your natural hands, your ability to catch the football really shows up at the next level. So when looking at Dane's top six receivers there, make sure the injury histories check out and make sure they can catch the football. I think if those two things clear, you're on a great path to contribute early in the NFL. And one thing that we always try and talk through is how everybody's draft board is, it's, you know, to to use the the scouting term, it's like a snowflake, right? Every, everybody's is going to look a little bit different and it's all going to be based not just on your own biases, but also on what your, your, uh, the way that your scheme is built uh, as a, as a franchise, right? So if you prioritize yards after catch, well, then those yards after catch guys are going to cater more towards what you look for. If you've got uh, a lot of size, but you need speed, well, maybe the speed guys are bumped up vice versa. If you've got a lot of speed, you need some size maybe the size uh, those guys are going to go up and I, to me it's uh that's why you know when, when we get through like rankings and how guys are stacked 
I try, and even when I, I look at my own notes on players, like how I have them ranked doesn't matter to me, right? Like to me individually, I look at more, what's the evaluation uh, on the player? Did I, did I get that part of it right? Did I feel good about what I thought a guy's strengths and weaknesses were? And you can talk about this as a receiver, but you know, we've been doing our, our scout story segment on a weekly basis here over the last couple of months. And how many times have we heard Eagle scouts come on the show and talk about, linebackers or safeties or defensive linemen and say, Hey, you know what? It's uh, the, the toughest part about the projection is that all these guys have different body types and different skill sets. It's not apples to apples comparison with all of them. And Ben, I think it's something you and I talk about all the time when we're watching a guy is like, Hey, like, man, like I could just see this guy being a great fit for this kind of an offense. But if you play this way, I don't know that it would work. If you play, if you, you might be a great fit for the Arizona Cardinals, but for the Ravens, I don't know that you would play. I think you can have that discussion really across so many different positions in the draft. Yeah, absolutely. I think putting these guys in positions to be successful is obviously a major, major bargaining chip with the success rate. No doubt. All right, let's get to uh, let's get to the next question. You're staying with the receiver class. Uh, ben McCardo left a uh, left this question. Let's say the Eagles are on the clock with one of their picks in round one and they want a wide receiver. What flavor of wide receiver do you see as a fit with the current personnel at the position? Do you think that they would go for more speed like a Jahan Dotson or Chris Olave or more size like a Drake London or a Traylon Burks or more route running uh, polish? Ben, I'll come to you first with this one. Um, you know, look, we don't know what that what this is going to look like. Obviously, this is going to be strictly Ben's opinion. But how do you view a wide receiver fitting into what the Eagles have uh, already in the building at this point? Well, I want some diversification and versatility to that receiver room. So be a little creative there, Ben McArdle, and don't even look right to the receiver group. Hmm. How about some of these move tight ends in this class? The Greg Dolichs of the world, the former receivers that have good size, yards after catchability, the Connor Haywards of the world, the fullback, running back, H-back kind of hybrids, Derek Deese. San Jose State is a really interesting athletic tight end or maybe some of these running backs like Tyler Beatty and James Cook. So while when you're trying to add some different styles to the receiver room, open up the collect the collective thought process and think about matchups and matchup nightmares and ways to attack opposing defenses and say, how can we diversify our pass game? Don't just think about the receivers. Think about matchups and then think about body types and traits and abilities and really start to expand that kind of palette into other position groups. Because the NFL, there's all different shapes and sizes now. It's a creative, creative uh, kind of offensive approach with a lot of teams. So I don't think you necessarily need a true and true receiver, Fran. Yeah, and I think Dane, uh, that's to kind of catch Dane up because obviously he's not watching the Eagles on a weekly basis. But I think when you look at uh, the way that this the scheme works is that it's a, a yards after catch focused offense. The Eagles finished in the top five in yards after catch per reception. When you look at uh, the way that they utilize, they want to get the ball to these guys fast. And if you look at Nick Sirianni kind of crystallize what that depth chart looks like right now. Devontae Smith, number one. Quez Watkins, who has been a, a vertical speed downfield threat for a very aggressive pass game uh, here this year. He is the number two. Jalen Rager has been more uh, gadgets and end arounds and shallow crosses. You'll see him work a little bit on the perimeter as well as the number three guy. How do you think you, if you're, the, if you're kind of making the call, how do you view adding to that receiving core? Uh, well, yeah, I think there's different ways you could go here. I, I yeah. think there two names really stand out to me in two different directions. Garrett Wilson out of Ohio State, to me, is the clear top receiver in this draft uh, because of what he does before and after the catch. And I think that fits really well with, uh, you know, what the uh, what, what the Eagles want to do with their offense. But I, I really like the idea of dropping Drake London into that offense as well. A, a guy that has basketball athleticism, so he's, he's not, uh, you know, he's not a bad athlete by any means. But he has size. He brings a huge catch radius. And for a quarterback like Jalen Hurts, uh, you know, I think it just it's going to give him more confidence when you're targeting a player like that. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, Eagles fans saw, you know, Mike Evans and what he did uh, for for the Bucks in that playoff game. Uh, Drake London could be a variation of that. Uh, I don't think he's quite Mike Evans, but he could be that style uh, of wide receiver. So I, I, I really like the idea of Drake London in that offense. But uh, Garrett Wilson would make a lot of sense, too, because I think he is the top playmaker in this draft. Yeah, I think when you look even like a guy like a Traylon Burks could be like that happy medium where you can move him around and do all kinds of things with him, get him the ball fast and let him work. But he's also a really interesting piece in the run game as well. They lined him up all over the formation as uh, a wing tight end at times and use him as a blocker. And we know how much the Eagles like to run the football. So that's what makes Traylon Burks from Arkansas uh, such an interesting option there as well, Ben. 
And Fran, what are some things that Coach Sirianni really values? You know, the tough yak ability and that kind of quick game offense, but receiver blocking, playing versatile alignments and positions, a lot of those kind of traits and philosophies you brought over from Indianapolis Colts. I just think you can check a lot of boxes yep. with some of those more creative style type players. Like I had mentioned, those tight ends, yep. the awkward H backs, maybe the pass catching running backs. Don't necessarily think it has to be a through and through wide receiver on the shirt there. Yeah, Naheem Hines uh, is a guy that comes to mind as a guy that can be that kind yep. of a player. Certainly Trey Burton in 2019 or 2020, rather, what he was for that Colts offense, right? We watched a ton of that film uh, last offseason preparing for Nick Sirianni coming to Philadelphia. Uh, let's get to the, the next question here. This one comes from David Wilson, who says, love the show. Would love to get this group's predictions on someone who everyone predicts currently will be a first round pick that could slip down in the draft like Jer- Jeremiah Owusu-Koromoa did last year to the Cleveland Browns. And then also someone who is a sleeper who could surprisingly vault into the first round. Now, obviously with JOK uh, and Dane, correct me if I'm wrong here, pretty sure the reason he fell was like a late medical thing that was yeah. a little bit, it was late to get the information back to teams. There were like late tests or on a combine recheck that weren't all the, all the way submitted yet. Uh, and so that was the, that cloudiness caused him to fall. But that said, we can talk through this a little bit. I think it's kind of interesting. We'll we'll start with the uh, we'll start with the negativity first. I, I like ending on a positive note. So uh, Ben, I'll come to you first. Who's a guy that you feel uh, people are talking about high in a draft right now that you feel has that ability to fall uh, out of round one into the early stages of round two or below? All right. So two quick points here. I really think George Carl Aftis is going to be the victim of people overthinking him not being an exceptional tester and them going for these developmental upside guys mm. with the explosiveness like the Ojabos of the world. But I look at who just dominated the NFL, TJ Watts, Trey Hendrickson's. That's Carl Aptis right there. Don't overthink this. But I think he is going to slide into the teens, maybe even the 20s when it's all said and done. Big mistake. The other thing, guys, the tweener hybrids of the worlds. Hybrids when you're excited, tweener when you don't know what to do with them. Right. And I think some of the guys in that category are going to fall because you don't know what to do with them. You know, the Darian Canards of the world. Or some may view as a tackle, some may see as a guard through and through, a little bit caught in no man's land there, there or even like a DeMarvin Leal, who I think is a really, really good player, strong player, good run defender, three down player, positionally versatile. But what is he to certain teams? And I think teams will overlook that and maybe not have a clear snapshot of where they want to play him. Leal's a guy I've been seeing slide into the late 20s, some even into the 30s and that back end of round one. I think Leal, Kennard, those hybrid types, usually a kind of dangerous formula to slide. Dane, how about you? Yeah, and you know, Ben just sniped my answer because I was uh, looking at uh, Leal. Uh, I think that's a – and really, let's just talk about these defensive tackles. Let's throw Jordan Davis in there as well because Jordan Davis is a player who averaged 23 snaps a game at Georgia as a senior. And so, you know, yeah, you're getting a really good run defender – but he gives you basically nothing as a pass rusher. And I just, I don't know how many teams are going to be in the market for spending a first round pick on a guy that could potentially be a dominant run defender. But again, what's the total impact of what he's giving to your team? We're talking about a early down player who's not going to play a ton of step uh, snaps. Uh, You want to keep him fresh. And so he's not, it's not like he's going to go to the NFL and all of a sudden be playing 40 snaps a game. So I, I just when you think about total impact and what's worth it at that point, I don't know that Jordan Davis is that no brainer, you know, top 20, top 25 pick that uh, some people do. And, and then with Leal, I, I think there's a good chance that he does fall out of the first round just because, I, I mean, you watch his film and it's like, OK, you see the traits, but I want to see more. I, I want I, he just leaves you wanting more uh, as a player in terms of backfield production, in terms of in, impacting the game. Uh, you know, if, if the, if blockers are able to get their hands on him, it's just not enough, uh, of him stacking, shedding and, and making a play. So, uh, I, I think we could see defensive tackle, and this is not a strong defensive tackle group overall, but specifically those two guys that get mentioned as possible first round picks wouldn't be surprised if both of them fell a little bit. One guy I feel like we've seen it already a little bit is someone who was in the top 10 of pretty much every mock draft going back to the spring and the summer. And that's USC's Drake Jackson off the edge. Um, you know, I, we've talked about him in the past before here on the show. Uh, I've compared him in the past, to like a Chandler Jones, where he's got that long gangly frame that could just be awkward to try and block. Uh, but kind of like what you were saying with Leal, Dane, the, the traits are all there. I just, he has not really kind of uh, come through from that truly productive season. Now he's played a number of different roles. USC's defense hasn't really been great over the course of 
the last couple of years. And that hasn't always been uh, on Drake Jackson. You see, you can't always put it just on him. We've had the production talk uh, in the past, especially with edge rushers. But uh, now you're seeing more Drake Jackson settle into that early stage of round two in mock drafts as opposed to, uh, you know, the early stages of round one where we just saw him, you know, four or five, six months ago. Uh, let's go now to the, the positive end of this argument. Uh, and let's go with a riser. Ben, I'll come back to you. Who's a, a riser, uh, someone that you think could surprise us and end up in the first 32 picks? Jalen Petrie, Baylor, all Ooh, day long. This wow. kid is a stud. This is exactly what the NFL wants, needs, has been coveting. Uh, that kind of nickel Sam halfway player that can defend the slot, blitz, be a run support guy. You want him to play dime linebacker in a pinch, he could probably do that too. Plays much tougher than that six foot, 200 pound frame suggests. Leader, captain for that Dave Aranda, awesome Baylor Bear defense. Don't overthink this kid. I think he's just as quality a player as Daxon Hill. Mm. He's kind of getting similar type of love here. Jalen Petrie, anybody that puts on his tape comes away kind of gushing and salivating about this kid. I think he's going down to Mobile, so I expect him to turn some heads there. No idea how he's going to test. Don't overthink his film. This is a really good player. Yeah, he's a really interesting player and was used in so many different ways over the course of his career uh, with the Bears. Dave, Big 12 the- Defensive Player of the Year, yep. too. So he's a guy that's obviously gotten the uh, the accolades. All-American this year. Yep. Yeah, and he, he's a guy that he he was part of that. Uh, he, he committed Dart Bryles. He goes back a ways, and, and he was one of the few, one of the only that stuck with Baylor and said, wow. this, is a, this is a school that took a, a chance on me. I'm not leaving this school, and I, I think you can see the fruits of his labor. Um, I'm going to go with a couple of guys that are personal favorites of mine, two of my favorite players in, in the entire draft too. Um, so, I mean, some of my bias is showing, but I still think that they could ease, both could easily go in the first round. Logan Hall, defensive uh, lineman from Houston, uh, a, a guy that 6'6", 270, still 21 years old, still learning uh, just how good he can be. I like him better on the edge. He can kick inside. Uh, I, I think that he's a, when you stack the top 32 players in this draft, I think it's hard not to include Logan Hall in there. And then Bernard Raymond from Central Michigan, who, uh, you know, we've been talking about him all season. Uh, just one of the one of the most fun stories in this class uh, coming from Austria, the way he, he was a tight end and he made the transition to the tackle uh, in the midst of a pandemic. And then just how strong he played uh, against Missouri, against LSU this year um, has athleticism, not the longest player, but he has athleticism, has play strength. Uh, really smart guy, really just uh, a, a great uh, a teammate and a guy that the coaches love to coach. So both those players, Logan Hall, Bernard Raymond, I think both have an excellent shot to go run one. I love it. Well, it's a, uh, you know, a really interesting group overall, the players we've hit on. And I would be uh, remiss if I did not mention my guy, Quay Walker, uh, the linebacker from Georgia, six foot four, 240 pounds, only a one year starter, stepped into the starting lineup here this season. But talk about checking boxes at six, four, 240. Uh, this guy is not a lumbering athlete at all. He's got speed. He can play downhill. He can play in coverage. He can blitz. He can play against the run. He's outstanding through contact. I think when you look at Quay Walker, he checks all of the physical boxes you're looking for at the linebacker position. He can do a lot of different things for you. Uh, I know Daniel Jeremiah just had him in his round one mock draft uh, that dropped over on NFL.com last week. He was on the back end of round one. So we'll see if that buzz continues to pick up there uh, after we get out of the senior bowl. Really, really quick, Fran, actually just cut a little breakdown tape on Quay Walker for our senior bowl coverage for Daniel Jeremiah. So I got to see some closer, clearer footage from some of the melts and TV broadcasts. Some of the hits he had this year, so, so violent. And in a short area form where he's literally just getting up to speed in a yard and knocking people off their feet with his face. He's a form tackler that will put his face right into you and finish your ass. Sorry, your butt uh, backwards. You know, he's a really impressive player. He is uh, explosive. I, you see that twitch with the way he moves. And again, 6'4", 245, long arms. My only question with Quay Walker is just coverage. Uh, I, I, I want to see more out of him uh, when he's asked to go in reverse and play a little bit in space. And, uh, you know, doesn't have a ton of ball production, doesn't have uh, – and, and, you know, it, it's tough with that Georgia defense, with the way they sub in and out. Only a one-year starter in that defense. So there's a couple – questions I have with him, but it's not necessarily that he can't do it. It's just, we haven't seen enough of him uh, doing it, but yeah, there's a, a lot of reasons to be excited about Quay Walker. 
Hey, there's uh, that's something he will get asked to do uh, next week at the senior bowl. So we'll get a chance yep. uh, to see that. I did see him match up on tight ends a little bit uh, here in that defense, but uh, this is a guy that really, really excites me. And we actually got a Quay Walker question uh, from big Sean Dub on Twitter, who left, uh, who left this question. Who would you consider the best three, four edge rushers, a stand up linebacker? And would you put Quay Walker in that category, given his size? So Sean, real quick, um, yeah, I guess you could, you could put Quay Walker as like a 3-4 Sam, and I think he could do it. Uh, you know, again, at 6'4", 240, like that is a frame that works uh, for that role. I don't think that you need to put him there. I think you could, but I think that kind of speaks uh, to his versatility. Dane, I don't know if uh, you feel strongly one way or another about that. I'm, ben, I'm interested to get your thoughts as well. Well, and the thing with Quay Walker is he was always an outside guy. He played defensive end in high school too. Right. Defensive yep. end, outside linebacker, and then – they moved him inside at Georgia, and that's why it kind of took a little bit, a couple of years, for Quay Walker to really settle into that role. Uh, but he has that in his background uh, where I think he could do it and, and still be a stud. Uh, I, I mean, looking at uh, you know some of these some of these pass rushers, a guy like David Ajabo, uh, stand him up, let him play in space. I think that's something that he could do. And MyJ Sanders uh, from Cincinnati. I'm, I'm really curious to see. My J. Sanders, what he looks like up close and personal at the Senior Bowl. Uh, you know the body type, how much weight is he carrying, uh, taking on blocks. Uh, you know when he's asked to play in space, and so My J. Sanders is a name that that really was the first name that came to mind with this question. You know, Quay could be a guy that plays in that kind of stack role on early downs, and just as a sub rusher, a la Michael Parsons, Parsons and his yeah. season is pretty good blueprint mm-hmm. right there. Maybe not quite to the level of freak show athlete, but. Also not far behind either. So a couple other names I'll throw into the three, four kind of odd front edge rusher, Nick Benito, Oklahoma, really loose, about 230. Check out his tape, all sorts of spin moves and dip moves, high side rusher. And a guy I really like, hybrid player, kind of all over the place in his career, Jesse Lucchetta at Penn State, I think has an excellent, excellent profile and play temperament, played a little bit of off ball last year, much more of a Sam outside linebacker this year down on the line of scrimmage, really feisty kid about 6'3", 245, 250. I think he's going to be a good pro. Yeah, it's it's so funny having that conversation because I think it's it used to be like, oh, well, this guy, he he's too small. He's got to play off the edge. And I don't know that that's necessarily the case now. Uh, you know, I, I was listening to um, – to Aiden Hutchinson on the green light pod with, uh, with Chris long, this was a, a few weeks back. And he was saying like the biggest thing for him this season in 2021 compared to previous was that when they got the new defensive scheme, they, they let him stand up a little bit and he just saw the field so much better standing up from a two point stance. And so I don't think we're looking at Aiden Hutchinson and say, Hey, this guy would be a better fit as a three, four backer, but you can bet that he's going to go to his coaches when he gets to the NFL, wherever that is and say like, Hey, like I really want to be able to stand up on occasion. And you know, I could see the field so much better. And so I think that's a, important part of the conversation a couple other guys i really like standing up uh kingsley and from uh from south carolina jermaine johnson i thought some of his best reps from mm-hmm. florida state with where uh he was in a two-point stance and then drake jackson as well we talked about earlier from usc uh just a couple games guys i would throw in on the back end there steve hellmeyer uh left a uh, left this question who's a player on offense and a player on defense that you're going to be watching most closely at the senior ball. So a little bit of a senior pro, senior ball preview for next week, which we will be doing here uh, in the coming days as well. Ben, uh, let's go for you first on offense. Who's a guy that you'll be studying here uh, closely uh, when we get to Mobile next week? Well, the low hanging fruit conversation here is the FCS players, the D2s and D3s. So my eyes kind of go right to them to see them bumped up against the uh, higher level competition, the group of sure. fives and power five players. I want to see Christian Watson, North Dakota State. I want to see, first of all, I need some official measurements on this kid because he's grown an inch every year on his bio on the team site. So I really want to see what his height weight is officially. And then really just how he competes down there in one-on-ones and, uh, you know, his blocking and in the run support and how he looks with his movement skills. He's a guy that's all over the place on boards. I see some people liking him maybe as a fringe top 50 player. I've seen some priority free agent grades on him. So I think Mobile, the Combine, really going to solidify his kind of profile, his stock, and uh, who they think he can be at the next level. Dane, how about you? Uh, I'm going to go with the pair of tackles. Uh, uh, Trevor Penning, uh, you know, Ben mentioned the FCS level and seeing guys. Uh, Trevor Penning is so gifted, so naturally talented, but how often was he really challenged at that at that level? And so I want to see Trevor Penning, uh, see how he does in one-on-ones, and then Daniel Falele, uh, just we know how massive he is. We know, uh, you know, the size and the length, the wingspan. But in a one-on-one opportunity uh, against a pass rusher, a quick twitch pass rusher, 
how can he hold up? Can he sink? Can he uh, react in short spaces? So uh, I, I think that we, you know, we know he's a good athlete for that size, but how is he going to hold up in one-on-ones uh, during practice? So those two tackles, I think, are going to be, uh, you know, maybe the main attraction for me uh, during the week of practice. I mean, to me, Ben, when you said low-hanging fruit, the first thing I went to, I was like, oh, he's going to talk about the quarterbacks. I think we have such a unique <laughs> uh, scenario for everybody. In the, when you're following the NFL draft, I mean, what is it? It's five of the top six, six of the top seven quarterbacks uh, in this class are going to be in Mobile. And that's something you don't really get to see because uh, the underclassman ranks, the only guy that uh, I think most people would view as a top player is Matt Corral. He's not eligible to go to Mobile, but all the other guys were. And so you're going to see, uh, obviously, like Malik Willis and Desmond Ritter, but we're going to get a chance to see Sam Howell. And uh, really, you just go down the list. All of these quarterbacks on display, you're going to see Kenny Pickett. We're going to see the, all the top names that everyone's talking about as potential round one early round two options in this class uh so insert quarterback here is the way i'm kind of looking at it i think it's going to be such an interesting uh exercise here for everybody following this quarterback class i can't wait to see uh how these guys perform in mobile and see because we've seen in the past where guys come in and they're talked about uh as late round one early round two and then they go down and the one guy sets himself apart from the rest and now we're talking talking about him as as a top half of the first round guy so uh whoever that is uh we'll see but i can't wait to see how it all uh plays out ben Eh, nobody uh, cares about the quarterback position fran that's a plug and play position over over hype yeah exactly (laughs) Go all ahead, six dude. of those guys might be top 100 picks when it's yeah. all said and done. It, it, it is possible. And it, we, you're right. We rarely see that uh, from a senior bowl. Usually there's a mix of late round guys, a few early round. This year, it, it's it's wide open. And it's a really a big opportunity for, for all these guys, whether it's uh, – and, and you have the Lions coaching one team who could be in the mix for a quarterback, if not with that – you know, the second overall pick with their second sure. – first round pick uh, in the late one. So uh, it, it's a really interesting th- dynamic in this with this group. Yeah, and I think when you're just looking at just, a, again, just a really unique opportunity there uh, for that group. Let's go over to the uh, the defensive side. Ben, I'll come to you first. All right, same kind of formula here. Go my division two buddy here at uh, Fayetteville State. That's Joshua Williams, who's a really interesting, tall, long press corner with really quick feet and long speed. Just need to see him against some better competition. I didn't love the film at Fayetteville State. Not his film, but literally the quality of film. It was a little shaky at times. Late in the season, the guys weren't opening the window, so there was some reflection. You know, some film watching stuff here and there. Long story short, we want to see Joshua Williams up close there down in Mobile. Did we get a bouncy house in the background? There was no bouncy houses. I think that's just Bucknell. I haven't fired up that Bucknell tape in a while, but Fayetteville State, some of the tapes were better than others. Just comes with the territory here of uh, watching some uh, some video of some D2 and D3 guys. But he's 6'2", official, 197 with long arms. He has a high school sprinting background with all sorts of 100-meter, uh, 200-meter hurdles, long jump. He's a really interesting player. And remember, Quinn Miners at this point uh, in the calendar, no one was talking about Quinn Miners a year ago and went down to the from D3, went down to the Senior Bowl and was the best offensive lineman, arguably, uh, in Mobile, ends up being a second round pick. So I he, wouldn't well, say nobody. Well, I wouldn't say nobody. Nobody, you know, for the, for no, one, no one has that kind of a guy, I would say. Like, did, did you have Quinn Miners in your, your two round mock draft for Mobile? Uh, I had him as a fourth rounder. So All right, there you go. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. No one is no one is a second rounder. Right? No one was talking about in that in that in that round. Oh, yeah. uh, right, I don't think anybody had here. Wisconsin Whitewater tape at that point of the season <laughs> last year. So yeah, they didn't have gained. a season. They didn't have right. a season. Right, they <laughs> yeah. didn't so you really had to know a guy to find some of that off the back of a truck. But even like an FCS, Spencer Brown didn't play last fall. Sure. Goes to Mobile, has some ups, has some downs. It's been a pretty nice uh, offensive lineman for our Buffalo Bills, who just uh, competed right down to the wire yesterday. All right, Dane, who, give us uh, your defensive player. Uh, well, I went with uh, a few tackles uh, for offense. I'm going to stay with those one-on-ones and, uh, you know, look at the pass rush position. And some of these, uh, you know, non-obvious pass rushers, the guys that maybe aren't as well-known, like uh, Dominique Robinson from Miami of Ohio. Uh, you know, you love the backstory, former core, high school quarterback, goes to wide receiver at Miami of Ohio, and then 2020 moves the pass rusher. Uh, you know, just a, you don't really see that transition very often, but he looks the part. He's 6'5", 255 pounds. Uh, he's never started a game at defensive end in his life. He was a reserve uh, for the Red Hawks. And so, uh, but he has so much ability. And, and, I, and I'm really excited to see what he can do uh, down there in Mobile against some of these tackles. 
uh, you know, Amari Barno from Virginia Tech, same type of thing. Uh, Boy Mafe from Minnesota. So they, really, they, this group of pass rushers who are toolsy and they have they have clear ability, but how do they do in, in a all star setting against some really good tackle play? And for me, I'm going to go to the cornerback spot. Uh, Roger McCreary from Auburn, uh, you could argue, could be the best player in Mobile. So just excited to see what he can bring. Uh, potential top 15, top 20s talent uh, in this draft. Senior corner from Auburn, uh, Roger McCreary, I think checks a lot of boxes. The size is just okay. I don't think he's, he's not what you would call undersized, but he's not a six foot, six foot one corner. But I think when you look at Roger McCreary, you realize that this guy just checks so many boxes. Excited to see what he brings. Uh, and speaking of corners in Mobile, here's a question from Stefan711. What cornerback has the most to gain over the week in Mobile? Uh, ben, I'll come to you first. What corner is under the spotlight for you? Well, it's going to be a guy that just converted to cornerback from receiver. That's Tariq Woolen from UTSA. It was really interesting looking athlete profile at 6'4", 200 pounds with a track profile that I think he has a 4-3 under his belt as well. So a little bit new and raw to the position. I think the sky's the limit. So down in Mobile, let's figure out what he can do, what he can't do, how he looks against some higher level competition. I think he has the most to gain down there in Mobile. I like it. I'm I'm going to, I'm, I want to mention McCreary because he has a lot to gain with the measurements. Uh, in the spring, scouts measured him at under 30 inch arms. And that's, that's a big red flag. Uh, and so let's just hope that was a miscalculation. And, uh, you know, so the measurements are going to be big for uh, Roger McCreary. On the field, I, I'm really excited to see Jalen Watson from Washington State. Uh, this is a kind of a late bloomer. His background's just amazing. Uh, he didn't really have... Many, he was a, really an offensive player in high school, uh, didn't have a ton of offers, goes to JUCO, and then uh, it was a big-time JUCO recruit, signs with USC, but he didn't have the grades. And so he had to go back home to Georgia. He was working at Wendy's, uh, like it really, you know, kind of a, a dead-end spot. And then he was able to, you know, persevere, get his grades on track, and goes to Washington State in 2020. And then the last two years really kind of blossomed as a, a future pro. So uh, a long bodied press man type of guy. I, I think Jalen Watson has a chance to really shine. I'm going to go with, with to the uh, the Big Ten where Cam Taylor Britt, the corner from Nebraska, I find to be a really fun player to study. Uh, ball skills, toughness, instincts, especially in zone coverage. The question you're going to have about Cam Taylor Britt uh, is can he play in man to man? And guess what he's going to be asked to do in one on one drills down in Mobile, which is always a tough spot for corners is those one on one drills. He's going to have to show if he can play man to man. If he can have a good week uh, in those drills and look like he can, you know, hit pocket with receivers and show that ability uh, to play sticky man coverage, I think that that will do wonders for Cam Taylor Britt. Because otherwise, you're talking about a guy that uh, checks a lot of the boxes that people are looking for at the cornerback position. So uh, a really fun player. Let's go over to the offensive side of the football. Neil Dutton uh, left a left us this question. There's no Kyle Pitts in this class, but apparently it's a good tight end class on the whole. Who would who should we be getting to know over the next few weeks? Ben, I'll come to you first. Well, I think the real important thing with this tight end class is just to get out of the norm because I think the best tight ends here are from some unconventional spots. That's Trey McBride at a Colorado state who I have as tight end one Isaiah likely at a coastal Carolina, I think is a heck of a player. Good blocker too. And Cole Turner from Nevada is probably the best red zone weapon threat in this class receivers included. He is a 6'6", ball-catching nightmare. So Cole Turner, Nevada, Isaiah Likely, Coastal, Trey McBride, Colorado State, maybe not your typical factories to the NFL. These might be the best tight ends in the class. Dan, hey, how about you? Uh, I, I got to go with Jeremy Ruckert. Uh, he could be the best tight end in this in this class. He has that type of ability. And uh, yes, he didn't have a ton of targets in that Ohio State offense, but that's just because that they prioritize the receivers. And Looking at the receiver talent they had in Columbus, it's not a big surprise. So Jeremy Rucker, uh, yes, he can block, but yes, he can also catch. And I think he's going to show that during practices. Uh, good things happened when he was targeted in that Ohio State offense. And so uh, I think Jeremy Rucker is a player that shouldn't shock anybody if he ends up being tight end one for at least a few teams around the league. 
he is an enforcer as a blocker, what he does, the point of attack, just so much fun to watch. Uh, I'm going to go with a couple guys that are former receivers that uh, have made the transition to tight end in a big way and have been productive. That's Isaiah Likely from Coastal Carolina, Greg Dulcich from UCLA. I think you both you see both guys have that ability to get down the seam. The, both guys have been a factor with the ball in their hands as well as uh, you know down the field. They, they both have that ability to be three-level weapons uh, in the pass game. They can get down the seam. They can win in the intermediate area. You can get them the ball fast and let them work. Isaiah Likely from Coastal uh, and I think Greg Dulcich from UCLA, two of the more intriguing options. It's a really good senior class of tight ends and it, maybe none of them are elite like uh, like Neil mentioned. No Kyle Pitts, but I think you look at the group overall, just a really fun class. Uh, let's get to the next one here from Ben. I saw something recently about how the Eagles have never drafted a safety in the first round. Uh, do you think that that safety or that, that changes this year and what is the safety class like? So Dan, I guess I'll come to you first. What is the safety class like this year? When you look at the, the overall group, how do you feel about it? Well, let's go to you first, Fran. Did have they ever drafted a safety in the first round? Let me. Uh, I'm going to look into that as <laughs> Dan is answering that question. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think the the underclassmen's definitely helped. Uh, you know, with Kyle Hamilton, uh, Daxton Hill, uh, Lewis Seen, uh, you know, like a Verone McKinley uh, from Oregon, uh, Dane Belton uh, with a great name, so he's a first round pick. Uh, <laughs> Nick Cross from Maryland. So I think the underclassmen. Uh, really helped this safety group. But the seniors have a lot to offer as well with Jaquan, with Jaquan Brisker. Uh, we talked about Petrie uh, earlier as a kind of a do-it-all safety. Uh, I'm a big fan of Brian Cook from Cincinnati, one of the best tackling players uh, in this draft. And then Kirby Joseph from Illinois, my one of my favorite sleepers in this class. And I don't think he's going to be a sleeper much longer, uh, especially after senior bowl. So uh, the safety class, maybe not – it, it comes. It's not going to come to your mind when you talk about the obvious best positions in this class, the deepest positions. But it's a pretty good group this year, and I think there's going to be several starters uh, in the NFL that come out of this, this this group. I think you nailed that, Dane. I think it's a really good class. It just maybe doesn't have the depth at the very top, but they do have the headliner and Kyle Hamilton. You know, just doesn't have the collective depth. I don't see a lot of these guys squeezing into the first round, but there's a lot of the NFL starters for different schemes and shapes and sizes. I thought you hit all the box guys, the versatile guys, the nickels, the back end guys. And I hold out hope for some cornerback cornerback uh, conversions too. Alante Taylor out of Tennessee. He is a feisty guy. Cam Taylor Britt that Fran just mentioned. He might be a guy that gets cooked in some one-on-ones that he slide into safety and let him use that six foot, 200 pound frame to, you know, elsewhere. Or maybe even a, a Damari Mathis from Pitt is a guy that has shown some really good temperament in his play in the run and coming up in flat support, even above a Bolden of the world. He's had obviously a turbulent college career. He is athletic and could be a tight end eraser at the next level. So a lot of different safeties, but outside of Kyle Hamilton just doesn't have that kind of headliner name at the top. To answer the the first part of that question, the Wikipedia search says no, no safety uh, in round one. Now we're trusting Wikipedia there on that one. Don't know if any of those guys uh, eventually turned into safeties, but uh, let's get to the next question here. Um, and this one is from uh, Connor27, who asked about Kyle Hamilton. Any chance the Eagles can move up to take Kyle Hamilton? I mean, obviously, this requires a two-way street, right? Somebody willing to move down. Uh, would two picks, 16 and 19, get you up to seven uh, to be able to make uh, that kind of a move? Uh, Dane, I'll guess, I guess I'll come to you. Just thoughts on uh, the ability to be able to move up, and do you feel like that's the range that Hamilton could go off the board? Yeah, you know, Hamilton's really a wild card because you could make the case he's the most talented player in the draft, uh, but only so many teams are going to be comfortable drafting a safety uh, that early, especially a safety like Hamilton, who's just so different. You know, he's six, three and a half. He's uh, almost as, you know, basically linebacker size, but he has range to play the entire field. You know, you have to have a specific plan in place for how you're going to use him and take advantage of all that versatility that he offers. So uh, I, I think he could be available at seven. And, you know, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, scenario that, you know, if, you, if, if you're a team like uh, the Eagles and you're looking for a playmaker in the back seven, you at least talk about it. Uh, you know, I don't think it's necessarily something that this, this team would, would do would trade multiple first round picks to go get a safety. But if you're looking for that playmaker and you think Kyle Hamilton could be the guy, it's worth the conversation. Jim Malloy uh, checked in saying, I wanted to see where Penn State linebacker Brandon Smith uh, might get drafted or should get drafted. Uh, ben, I'll come to you first. Obviously, a guy that's got physical tools. Uh, this is from Jimmy. Uh, we'll probably test, test off the charts, but has not played the position well uh, in his career. I know you've studied uh, Brandon Smith lately or recently. 
Yeah, I actually just watched him this morning uh, in combination with a bunch of other linebackers here. But he was a highly coveted player out of high school, five-star Gatorade Player of the Year out of Virginia, immediately on the freak list for some of his workout stuff. He's long. He's a good size speed player. He's good movement skills. I just think he's a little bit underpowered. I don't think he has enough shock or power in his hands in combination with his not playing with his hands enough very lean lower half where he really can't hold his ground or absorb contact gets rattled against offensive linemen too often not really a stack and shed player you have seen him in two different roles in 2020 he played more of a sam on the ball role this year much more of a mike will off ball i think he's a guy that can contribute in special teams and be a sub package player probably a day three pick i wrote down drew tranquil and probably his best play looks like a baron browning type um, but again, I'm just not really sure what his best his best trait is at this point. He's a well-rounded player. I know he showed up on the freak list, but I don't think he's an elite movement guy. I don't think he's an explosive guy. He's just a guy that moves really well with good size speed that should get you drafted in rounds five, six at the very latest. Um, and we'll see where he goes from there. Uh, you know, I... I... I think he's going to, I think the the question is right where, you know, saying he's going to test well, I think he's going to test really well. Um, and I'll just read the last three lines of my report on him. Uh, really physically impressive size, explosive movements. The mental side is really what is a work in progress at this point. Uh, he needs to learn uh, better anticipation to stay ahead of plays. He needs to develop his handwork to leverage gaps, stack and shed, get home as a blitzer. Overall, a long frame toolsy athlete with NFL starting potential, but the tape shows an uneven, unrefined player who must improve his processing, physicality, and finishing skills before he earns a significant role at the next level. So, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of things that should concern you uh, there, and you know, it's a upside pick, it's a development pick, and every team's going to look at it a little bit differently about where they're comfortable drafting a developmental player like that. He could go easily top 100 because he's going to test well at that size but i don't I, it would scare me drafting him on day two because of just the gap that he has to make up to become a significant player for your role for your uh a significant role on your defense it's a really fun segment there with ben and dane a little bit unique a little bit different than what we usually do here on the podcast but i thought we can kind of hit the pause button a little bit and answer as many of your questions as possible thanks so much to everybody uh, that submitted their questions for today's show again the best way to hit us up for future episodes go on over to apple Podcasts, leave us a rating leave us a comment we will break it down here in an upcoming episode later this week i'll be back with uh, with Ben. We'll have Eric Galco on the show later this week to really kind of dive into the top players you need to be paying attention to for next week's Shrine Bowl. We're going to have the Senior Bowl coming up. We'll have daily coverage from Mobile, Alabama starting next Monday. You do not want to miss our coverage of the Senior Bowl. Make sure you stay subscribed right here to the Journey of the Draft podcast presented by LifeBrand.